President Trump pulled the plug on the nuclear deal with Iran on May 8th and claimed that Tehran had failed to comply with the obligations. Yet, since no tangible evidence was presented, the unilateral decision places Washington in violation of its obligations under the pact. But regardless of who is right, the turn of events raises a lot of questions, and it remains to be seen what comes next. My name is Shirvan, and welcome to Caspian Report. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action was a diplomatic initiative that involved Iran, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, China, Russia, plus Germany. The group of countries, known as the P5 plus 1, reached an agreement in Vienna in July 2015 that restricted Tehran's nuclear program. In return, the international community lifted some of the sanctions that were placed on Iran. Since its ratification, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is the foremost authority on the topic, has consistently verified that Iran has largely complied with the terms of the deal. Yet, regardless of its functionality, Trump has repeatedly expressed his grief with the agreement. More specifically, the Trump government has identified four aspects it would like to see included or adjusted in the nuclear deal. These include Iran's ballistic missiles program, its regional activities, the inspections regime, and the sunset provisions which allows certain legal items to expire over time. However, the nuclear deal was specifically designed to restrict Iran's nuclear program, and in this context, it functioned adequately. But the deal was never meant to address non-nuclear proliferation issues. Thus, including or adjusting non-nuclear provisions within the current framework is not a feasible endeavor, nor is it something the international community looks forward to. Nonetheless, the Trump government considered the non-nuclear shortcomings as a deal-breaker and announced the exit from the pact. What's more is that in his announcement, Trump stated plans to reimpose all suspended sanctions on Iran. These include penalties to curb down Iranian energy exports by targeting the central bank in Tehran, as well as the hundreds of banks that deal in finances, insurances, banking, and precious metals. In addition, the sanctions would place noteworthy Iranian policymakers on the blocked persons list. Now, the most likely way for Trump to reimpose sanctions on Iran is to go through the legal channels that administer and enforce economic sanctions. This task falls under the jurisdiction of the Office of Foreign Assets Control of the US Department of Treasury. However, their protocols explicitly note that imposing sanctions can only take force after a period of 90 to 180 days. Much of the process depends on the unprecedented legal interpretations and the country in question. So somewhere along those timeframes, Washington will be able to reinstate the sanctions on Iran. Thus far, the international community has responded to Trump's decision with mixed feelings. British, French and German policymakers made a last-ditch effort to change the attitude of their American counterpart but ultimately failed. As such, immediately following Trump's statement, top officials of the European Union responded by saying that the US president does not have the power to unilaterally scrap the multilateral agreement. Officials from China and Russia reacted in similar ways and noted that they remain committed to the nuclear pact, including the provision for sanctions relief for the Islamic Republic of Iran, meaning the members of the agreement reject Trump's decision. But once the US sanctions are in place, any firm that wants to do business with Iran will immediately be subject to US secondary sanctions, which will cut them off from the US banking system. So if Washington reinstates sanctions, and the Europeans, Russia and China want to remain true to the terms of the nuclear deal, they will have to resort to non-dollar measures and pass such legislations to protect their companies. This would reduce the extent US sanctions can affect Iranian energy exports. For instance, if the European Union rejects to put in place a full embargo on Iranian oil imports, then Tehran stands to lose between half a million and a million barrels 
of crude oil per day, of the total 2.5 million exported barrels per day. Even though this is a significant number, it will not fundamentally alter the economic prospects of Iran. In this context, President Rouhani of Iran has called for restraint and said that his country remains committed to the pact. And as long as the Europeans remain true to the agreement as well, it would be in Iran's interest to abide by the nuclear terms. Doing otherwise would irreversibly damage Tehran's relationship with the European Union. However, the commitment of the Europeans to the nuclear agreement is dubious at best. They are simply unlikely to risk upsetting the United States. As such, despite the current defiance, the Europeans are most likely to comply with certain US sanctions eventually. Russia and China, on the other hand, have proven to be willing to take greater risks. Moscow has close security ties to Tehran, especially in the Syrian battle space, while Beijing is the largest importer of Iranian crude oil, followed closely by New Delhi. Russia, China and India also closely cooperate with Tehran in their respective grand economic policies. Some examples include the Indian-Russian Transport Corridor and the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, both of which involve Iran. What's more is that New Delhi and Beijing also rely on their access to Iranian energy for the development of their respective heavy industries. In short, while Europe is likely to comply with US sanctions, Moscow, Beijing, New Delhi on the other hand will be important partners for Tehran to navigate the sanctions environment. In the coming months, Rouhani is likely to seek for greater international support to push against Trump before the US reinstates economic sanctions. For Rouhani, the political well-being of his moderate faction depends on the ongoing economic reforms which are tied to the survival of the nuclear deal. At the start of 2018, protests erupted across Iran with many citizens complaining that the nuclear agreement had failed to provide the country with tangible economic benefits. In addition, Iranian conservatives are likely to exploit the weakened position of the ruling party. The conservatives believe that Rouhani's failure to reform the economy will allow them to dominate Iran's political landscape once again. This explains why some conservative members actually celebrated Trump's decision by chanting death to America in the Iranian parliament. So Trump's exit from the nuclear deal will further complicate the internal political balance in Tehran. Another faction that welcomed Trump's decision is the government of Prime Minister Netanyahu. The Israelis are in a proxy conflict with their Iranian counterparts. The two sides have been in a war of words for some time, but much of it was restricted to publicity stunts because the distance between the two was too far for a real conflict. That element is now changing. The current Iranian-Israeli proxy conflict is taking place in the Syrian battle space, with the former trying to carve a direct land corridor through its proxy Hezbollah in Lebanon. Israeli intelligence estimates that Hezbollah has roughly 150,000 rockets and missiles of all sizes in its possession, of which thousands can reach Tel Aviv. As such, Hezbollah is Israel's most imminent threat. Should Iran succeed in creating a direct corridor to Hezbollah, Tehran would be able to swiftly reinforce and strengthen the position of its proxy in Lebanon as well as create a second front by the Golan Heights. Currently, both sides are targeting one another with rockets, artillery and airstrikes. However, as Israel and Iran act to preserve their credibility, their responses and counter-responses are likely to get stronger over time. This cycle of violence requires only one miscalculation for a dramatic escalation. This is not a position that the Israeli leadership wants to be in, especially not on its own. Israel needs the United States in the proxy conflict against Iran, and the collapse of the nuclear deal helps to bring Washington into the fight. In the long term, Trump's withdrawal from the nuclear deal raises questions that affect the geopolitical standing of the United States. How can other nations trust the government in Washington to abide by its commitments when political winds change? This is particularly important considering the nuclear negotiations with North Korea. Moreover, if the deal collapses altogether, 
The government in Tehran will be free to expand its nuclear program as it was doing so until 2013. Designing a fresh nuclear accord with a resurgent Iran will be even more complicated than it was in the past. For all practical purposes, the collapse of the Iran nuclear deal opens Pandora's box. Before long, the Americans could face a new geopolitical dilemma with only two options. Washington could either allow Tehran to continue its nuclear program in absence of international monitoring, or the Americans could try and use forceful means to stop it. Neither options have particularly favorable outcomes. I've been your host, Shirvan from Caspian Report. Credit goes to our contributors on Patreon for making this report possible. Our crowdfunding platform allows us to remain independent and self-sustained from sponsors. Visit patreon.com slash caspianreport for more information. For now, thank you for watching and Savol.